Hello! Welcome to English for Everyone, where we practice real-life American English. If you want to expand your vocabulary and avoid important mistakes, this video is for you. So let's get started. Let's watch the first clip. And I just want to say that the sentence, um, I didn't notice any mistake, is technically and grammatically incorrect. Uh, but we can't use any with a singular countable noun in a negative sentence. So we should either say, I didn't notice a mistake or I didn't notice any mistakes. So which is correct? I didn't notice any mistake or I didn't notice any mistakes. Well, they're both correct. If I'm speaking in general, I say I didn't notice any mistakes. But if I'm expecting one and I don't see one, then we use the singular form. I didn't notice any mistake. This is also correct. We use this when you're expecting one, but don't see one. Example, I'm expecting a problem, but I don't see a problem. So I say, I don't see any problem. You can use a singular noun after any, in this case. Another example, I don't see any reason. I don't see any reason why. We can use a singular noun after any. Let's hear some examples. I don't see any sin. I don't see any mistake. I don't see any error. I don't see anything, any crime that he's worthy of being punished for. Alex, I don't see any problem there. Well, I don't see any problem here, Mr. Mitchell. Well, heck, I don't see any problem with that. At this point, I don't see any alternative. I don't see any margin at all, sir. But I don't see any reason why I should just sit here pretending I'm not home just because you're not that kind of girl. So, I don't see any reason for the children to stay in the hospital. I don't see any reason why I can't have both, Sheriff. So I don't see any reason why you can't try again in the future. How soon could I do that? David, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't say hello to Brandon. Let's watch another clip. He's telling people you can't say how long have you been learning English for, but actually you can, and it's a very common uh, way. It's a very common uh, question form, let's say. It's not common and it's not correct to say how long have you been learning English for. It sounds bad. You might hear a native speaker say it, but that doesn't make it right, and that doesn't make it sound good. It still sounds bad. It's like saying, I don't see nothing. You'll hear a lot of Americans say that, but that doesn't make it right, and it doesn't make it sound good. It still sounds bad. Don't say, I don't see nothing. Say, I don't see anything. It sounds better, don't you think? And don't say, how long have you been working here for? How long have you been working here for? It sounds bad, don't you think? It should be, how long have you been working here? That sounds much better. How long have you been studying English? <laughs> how long have you been learning English? How long have you been studying English? How long have you been studying English? How long have you been studying English? Great question to know the answer to. Your answer should be, I have been studying English for blah, blah, blah years or blah, blah, blah months or blah, blah weeks. So don't say, how long have you been working here for? It's not correct. And this is also not correct. Like, I don't, I don't even know where this comes from. Like, I can't even phantom where this thought is. Now, everything else he says is correct. It's not correct to say, I can't phantom. A phantom is a ghost. We need to use the verb fathom. I can't fathom. It means, I can't understand. Let's listen to some examples. Damn this, I just can't fathom it. Jerry, for some reason that I can't even begin to fathom, you really believe all this stuff, don't you? And it's hard to fathom the fear and turmoil and uncertainty that you experience. They swim faster than a torpedo and likely possess physical endurance that we can hardly fathom. This is also not correct. A 9 out of 10 with an asterisk, but with an asterisk. So I'm going to have to put an asterisk next to this category. But again, I have an asterisk there. Be I give her a nine with an asterisk. The word is not pronounced asterisk. There is no letter X at the end of the word. The two letters, S and K, make the sound sk, not x. The word is pronounced asterisk, not asterisk. Let's listen to some examples. Asterisk. Asterisk. This is called an asterisk. Asterisk. This one? Asterisk, not asterisk. 
Asterisk. This is also not correct. That is wrong. That is incorrect. She is teaching absolute incorrect English. Let's go ahead and look at the next idiom. Next one is very common on social media. Spill the tea. Spill the tea. I've never heard of this. Is this like the British version of spill the beans? Because the meaning according to her is the same, but you know, we say spill the beans. Nobody says spill the tea. We usually only say spill the tea when we literally mean that we spilled our tea. Okay. So if you went up to somebody and said, Hey, spill the tea, people would think that you actually made a mistake probably and thought that you meant to say spill the beans. So spill the tea is a common expression on social media. It means to gossip. And people use it a lot on the internet and on TV. Let's listen to some examples. To find it, we asked our friend Dr. Johansson from Be Smart to spill the tea about our ape-like ancestors. Mm. Okay, so spill oh. the tea. How, how is this different? Well, how much time do we have? One minute. That's all the time I need. Start, Start the clock. clock. First of all, if you thought they were going to come on TV and not really spill the tea, then you would be wrong as butt because they said everything. For our new segment, Spill the Tea, Ricardo, what's happening on the Education Beat? This season I started playing a new game called Spill the Tea. This award is given to the contestant who shared the best secret about themselves. And the award goes to... Open the envelopes. The winner is Carol for her first appearance on Spill the Tea. Let's see. Well, do. As they say, spill the tea. How did your date go? Spill the tea. So. Spill the tea. <laughs> <gasps> oh my god, she spilled the tea. While Amarion remained tight-lipped, Jones decided to spill all the tea on Nick Cannon's radio show in November 2019. Von D had no other way to reveal the drama than through Facebook, and boy did she spill that tea. As you can see, native speakers use this expression on social media, on TV, on the internet. Today, you're going to learn a very important word. Let's get started. First, let's watch a video clip. So in this video, we're going to review the content of five non-native English speakers and content creators. And we're going to give our honest opinions about the English content that's being presented. So let's get started. Let's go on to, what is it? Number four. Excuse me, could you bring me a fork, a knife, and a spoon? Flatware? Flatware, yes. Did you have anything that you uh, thought might be problematic for someone maybe thinking about moving to the United States and uh, learning English? Um, well, I mean, flatware, because actually, I, I, I don't know if somebody said you have flatware. Yeah. Um, now I'm wondering if flatware is actually silverware. Um, so, I mean, like, I mean, it's come to the point now that like these things, I, I, I'm just like, wait, or does that mean like pot, like a pan, like, like a pan to cook something? Is that flatware? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So it's like, it's like, um, yeah, we just wouldn't say this. And um, so do you think if someone, they were in a restaurant in the States and they asked for flatware without any sort of gesturing, would, would, the, would a server know what that meant? Let's say you don't have context. Let's just yeah. say a person's out in the middle of a field and then you ask them, do you have any, or and no, you said cutlery. Do yeah. you have any flatware? Yeah. Um, at that point, I might think that this is some sort of tool to maybe dig something or build something like. <laughs> right. Yeah. So potentially problematic for learners. Yeah. Yeah. He's confused. He doesn't know what flatware means. It's not a digging tool. It's not a pan. This is flatware. You can also say this is silverware or these are utensils. You can also say this is cutlery. The most common words are silverware and utensils. But Americans do know what flatware is. Not only do they know what it means, they also use this word in everyday English. So, oh, excuse me, where can I find the flatware? Plastic flatware? Uh, 
many would you like? Are you looking for a fourth? Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. I got some flatware. Excuse me, where can I find the flatware? Flatware for Here's the flatware. Here's the flatware. He knew what it meant. The sign says cutlery. So you can say cutlery or flatware or silverware. You can also say utensils. Oh, look, it's on the package. Flatware set. Flatware? Yeah, like plastic flatware. Um, I think the aisle 16 is right All 16? Yeah. Thank you. And here it is, the flatware. It's a family pack, and it says it right there. Assorted heavy-duty flatware. That's what it's called, flatware, or you can say utensils. These are utensils. It's the same thing. As you can see, Americans know what flatware is. There is nothing wrong with expanding your vocabulary. If you want to master English, there is nothing wrong with knowing this word. Because Americans do know what flatware is. Let's watch the next video clip. Flatware? But it's mm -hmm. just, again, not a word that we use. Americans do not use this word? This is not correct. It's not true. Because not only do Americans know this word, they also use this word in everyday English. Let's listen to some examples. You okay with the flatware that looks like bamboo? Sure. All right, JB, let's rock some china and some flatware. Does Willie Bank know you're stealing his gold flatware, Neil? This flatware is lovely. Mr. President, have you ever noticed how similar the Van Buren flatware is to the Buchanan flatware? Be on time and go steal the flatware. Yeah. And then I have gold flatware. Y'all know I love gold, so the gold flatware just... <laughs> Try using plastic flatware and glass cups and plates. These tea sets are porcelain and even the utensils are a special flatware set that was made in East Asia. This is like picnic ware and um, just like plastic flatware and stuff. And I sorted everything into um, like by category. So all the knives are here, all of the forks are here, and then all the spoons are right here. And I put them inside of Ziploc bags so nothing gets dusty when they're away in storage and um, they're just clean next time you use them. As you can see, not only do native speakers know this word, but they also use it in everyday English. This is also not correct. It can identify you to a region or a place. It's not correct to say region. We have to say region. We have to use the j sound, not the j sound. Sometimes the letter G is pronounced with a j sound but not in this case. We have to say region with a j sound, like in juice and jump. Let's listen to some examples. Another especially safe region is the Midwest or Rust Belt. And so and most of the lawyers um, in that region will come from particular law schools. By 1855, a railroad spanning the region significantly shortened the trip. In the 1600s, European colonizers destabilized this region. This bountiful region was the homeland of multiple Native American tribes. You see, the reason that this region is so good for Pino is that the cold air off the Pacific flows in at night. There have been some inclement weather in the region. The problem seems linked to what authorities are calling catastrophic power surge that has tripled traffic in the area. This is also not correct. This can be very difficult for people learning how to do connected speech is to make it sound natural and not make it sound like it is slurring. So when it is sounding like it is slurring, like how you speak when you're drunk, right? It's not correct to say it's slurring. If you're talking about speech, we have to say it is slurred. Speech is slurred. If you're talking about a person, we have to say he's slurring his speech. He's slurring his words. For example, he's drunk. He's slurring his speech. He's slurring his words. And his speech is slurred, not slurring. 
Today you're going to learn a very important word that might save your life. Let's get started. First, let's watch a video clip. So let's watch the first clip. Excuse me, is this water, um, sorry? I mean, is it good to drink? Yes, it is potable. Potable. Good word. The speaker is teaching the word potable. Potable is not a common word. It is rarely used. And I actually had to look it up myself after I watched this reel. I have no idea why she didn't know the meaning of the word and why she had to look it up. It is common and you will see it on signs. Potable water is drinkable water. It is safe to drink. And you might see a sign that says non-potable water. And if you don't know the meaning of the word, you might be in trouble. Because if you drink the water, you might get sick. Or you might even die. And you don't want that to happen. Non-potable water is not safe. It's not drinkable. You shouldn't drink it. Because you might get sick. It's not safe. And now let's see how native speakers use this word. And every year, three and a half million people die because of non-potable water-related diseases. Now, while in India, my parents always remind me to only drink boiled or bottled water. Because unlike here in America, where I can just turn on a tap and easily get clean, potable water. So there we just look at two potential potable water sources for Legionella. This would be non-potable water in this tank. This would be the boiler water. It will use 90% less potable water. Instead of finding food, focus on finding potable water. Dehydration will set in faster compared to hunger, and this will greatly affect your chances of survival out in the wild. But on the other side of it, perhaps material science can help me to create um, a water bottle that very, very quickly filters what would otherwise be non-potable water to make it potable. Those are the kinds of technologies or tools that so uh, that I'm also interested in. This is also not correct. The problems that she had before was a very strong R sound. It's not correct to say the problems that she had before was a very strong R sound. If you're saying was, you're talking about one problem. We have to say the problem that she had before was a very strong R sound. This is also not correct. It's not correct to say showing television clips aren't proof. We have to say showing television clips isn't proof. It's not about clips. It's about showing. Showing is a gerund. We have to say showing television clips isn't proof. This is also not correct. They are mistakes. I'm not going to deny, deny that. They are mistakes. There's no doubt about that. But they seem to hark on it a little bit too much. It's not correct to say hark on. We have to use the phrasal verb harp on. It means to talk about something repeatedly in an annoying way. For example, his room is really messy. His mother is always telling him to clean up the room. She is always harping on it. Let's practice. His room is messy. She is always telling him to clean it up. Is she always harping on it? That's right. She's always harping on it. Good job. Let's listen to some examples. They're always harping on how they're giving me a better life than they ever had. Why do you harp on that? So, try not to harp on the negative. This is not a mistake. Ah, it's just snowing. Did you guys notice the mistake? Now let's watch a clip from a video that I posted on my YouTube channel last year. Another important form of connected speech happens when we have two s sounds, one at the end of the first word, and then another s sound at the beginning of the next word. I didn't notice any mistake because there's no mistake. You can say it's snowing. You don't have to link the words. It's more common to link the words and say it's snowing. But if you're talking slow, you can separate the words and say it's snowing. It's not a mistake. It's fine. Let's hear some native speakers saying it's snowing 
and they separate the words and they don't link the sounds because it's not a mistake. It's um, snowing here today. As you can see, it's snowing pretty good here this morning at the care site. First of all, I hear that it's uh, snowing again in uh, Denver. The Barton Springs is the same temperature whether it's 105 out or whether it's snowing out, and I've been there when it was snowing. So, it's snowing here. And this is a mistake. What's the matter? I don't know. I'm coughing, and I've got runny nose. I cannot say, I've got runny nose. Nose is a countable noun, so I need an article. A. Uh, a uh, runny nose. I have to use the article a uh, because the word nose is a countable noun. It's correct to say, I've got a runny nose. Or I can say he. He's got a runny nose. Remember, I can say he has a runny nose, or I can say he has, contraction, he's got a runny nose. They both mean the same thing. You're expressing possession. Let's practice. Does he have a runny nose? That's right. He's got a runny nose. This is also not correct. A strange thing happened to me at the restaurant last night. Would you like another slice of pizza? Oh, no thanks, I'm full. Say it again, say it again. I'm full. <laughs> oh, you said fool instead of fool. Fool means stupid or crazy. I cannot say fool means stupid or crazy. First, it's countable, so I have to use an article, a fool. A fool means stupid or crazy? No, a fool means a stupid person. It doesn't mean crazy. It just means stupid. A fool means a stupid person. And pronunciation, it's not fool, it's fool. Use the dark L at the end. Link the sounds oo with the dark L. It makes an extra sound. Listen, fool, fool. A fool is a stupid person, not a crazy person. And use the article a, uh, a fool. Let's practice. What is a fool? Is a fool a stupid person? That's right, a fool is a stupid person. This is also not correct. If you want to see the stars at night, should you go to desert or dessert? Should you go to desert? We have to use an article. You can say the desert or a desert. But we need an article. What's the difference? A desert is one in general. And the desert is usually a specific one, but not always. I can say go to the desert for a general desert too. The point is, they're both correct. I can say a desert to speak more in general, or I can say the desert. The desert is the most common option, but we have to use an article. So the question is, should you go to the desert? And the answer is no, you shouldn't go to the desert. The weather is too hot. It's too hot in the desert. I think you shouldn't go to the desert. Let's practice. Should he go to the desert? That's right, he shouldn't go to the desert because it's too hot. It doesn't rain in desert or dessert. And I cannot say it doesn't rain in desert. Again, we need articles. It doesn't rain in the desert. Let's practice. Does it rain in the desert? That's right, it doesn't rain in the desert. Well, not very much. This is also not correct. Is loose. It's very big for me. It's not fit. I cannot say it's not fit. In this case, fit is a verb. I have to use doesn't and don't with verbs. So if I talk about my shoes, I can say my shoes don't fit. The size is not right. The size is not correct. The shoes don't fit. But if it's singular, I use doesn't. Example, the jacket. The jacket doesn't fit. The size is not correct. I cannot say it's not fit. Because fit is a verb, I use the negatives, don't or doesn't. The shoes don't fit, and the jacket doesn't fit. The size is not correct. Let's practice. Do the shoes fit? That's right, the shoes don't fit. Does the jacket fit? That's right, the jacket doesn't fit either. 
this is also not correct. But if you're thinking about 10 years from now, you're thinking about future or feature? Future. You're thinking about future? We have to use an article. We use the article the, the future. So it's correct to say you're thinking about the future. With future, use the article the. Example, he's thinking about the future. I can also use possessive, his future. He's thinking about his future. Or with the, he's thinking about the future. Let's practice. What is he thinking about? Is he thinking about the future? That's right, he's thinking about the future. This is also not correct. Be careful. Cup and cop. What was the difference? Lesson again, lesson carefully. These words are pronounced differently. The first word is k, k. We have to make the short sound, uh, uh, with a closed position, uh, uh, k, k. And the second word is cop. It's more open, cop, like hot and stop cop. So it should be cup, cop. Listen again? He means listen again. The word is pronounced listen, not lesson. We need a short i sound like this is. L -l listen. So it should be cup, cop. Listen again. Let's play that clip again. Be careful. Cup and cop. What was the difference? Lesson again, lesson carefully. Again, pronunciation. Cup, cop. Listen again. This is also not correct. Now imagine me saying, yesterday I was talking to a cup. We don't pronounce the word yesterday, yesterday. It's pronounced yesterday. We need the er sound like burger, er. How do we make this sound? You take your tongue and you put it back the back of the tongue against the back of the mouth. You make a voice here, er. The tongue is in the middle. It's not touching the top, it's not touching the bottom, it's just in the middle. Make the voice, er, yesterday, yesterday. Not yesterday, but yester, yesterday. This is also not correct. The next pair of confusing words, recit versus recipe. Now pay attention because this can lead to a very embarrassing situation. First, pay attention to the pronunciation. Recit, recit. Is there a P? No, you do not pronounce the P because it's silent. Recit, recit versus recipe, recipe, recipe. Now, recit is a piece of paper that shows that you have paid for something. For example, I bought this iPad and I have received the recit. We don't pronounce the word recit, recit. We don't use the short i like this is. We use a long e like green beans. The word is pronounced receipt, receipt. We're putting the stress on the second syllable. So it's important to pronounce it correctly. Receipt, receipt. Not recit, but receipt. And remember, the p is silent. Don't pronounce that p. Receipt. This is a receipt. So I have my receipt. Let's practice. Do you have your receipt? That's right, I have my receipt. This is also not correct. If you put up with something or if you put up with somebody, it means you tolerate without complaining. He's always complaining about everything, but his parents put up with him. I mean, he's annoying, but his parents say, ah, oh, that's our child, what should we do? Oh, let's just tolerate. I cannot say let's just tolerate. When I use the verb tolerate, I need an object. I can say it, let's just tolerate it. Or I can talk about a person and say him, let's just tolerate him. But I need an object. Example, your neighbors are very loud. What do you do? Do you call the police or do you just tolerate it? Do you just tolerate them? So if you're talking about behavior, you can say it. And if you're talking about people, you can say them. But we need an object. You just tolerate it. Or you just tolerate them. Let's practice. What do you do when your neighbors are loud? Do you just tolerate it? Very good. What do you do when your neighbors are loud? Do you just tolerate them? 
Very good. This is also not correct. He's an old friend. We hadn't seen each other for a long time, you know, since I drifted off. Drift off? What? We I drifted off? Drifted off means something completely different. So I can't say he's an old friend. I hadn't seen him for a long time. You know, since I drifted off. He means since we drifted apart. When you don't see someone very often and the relationship ends because you don't see each other very much, we say drift apart, not drift off. So if you don't see your friend for a long time and you don't stay in contact, you don't call him, your friend doesn't call you, use drift apart. You drift apart. But you can't say I drift apart. You need two people. We drift apart. Or in the past, we drifted apart. Example, they were friends, but they stopped talking to each other. They drifted apart. Let's practice. What happened? They don't talk anymore. Did they drift apart? That's right. They drifted apart. So what is drift off? It means something completely different. It means when you fall asleep. Example, he was sitting on the sofa watching TV and he fell asleep. I can say he drifted off. Drift in the present, in the past, drifted. He was watching TV and he drifted off. The idea, he fell asleep. Let's practice. What happened? He was sitting on the sofa watching TV and what happened? Did he drift off? That's right, he drifted off. The idea, he fell asleep. This is also not correct. The next one is to harp up about something. Harp up. What does it mean? Well, to harp up about something means to continue talking about something again and again and again and again and again and Five again. Five hours later. Again and again and again. That is to harp up about something. It's very annoying, isn't it? I cannot say harp up or harp up about. This does not exist in English. The expression is harp on, not harp up. You harp on something or you harp on about something. It means you keep talking about it and other people don't like it. You harp on something or you harp on about something, but you cannot say harp up. Let's listen to the example. Look at this example. Can you stop harping up about how great Miranda looked at the party? Can you stop harping up about how great she looked at the party? So here's my friend saying, Whoa, did you see Miranda? Whoa, Miranda was amazing. Whoa, I like Miranda. Whoa, did you see her boyfriend? Whoa, she was amazing. And I said, Oh, come on, dude. Would you stop harping up about her? This is not correct. I cannot say you can't stop harping up about how great Miranda is looking. Stop harping up about her? Again, this does not exist in English. It's harp on. So it's correct to say, can you stop harping on about how great Miranda looked at the party? So example, he was harping on about how great she looked. He kept talking about it and he was annoying other people. They didn't like it. That's when we use this expression. He kept harping on about how great she looked. Let's practice. Was he harping on about how great she looked? That's right. He was harping on about how great she looked. He kept talking about it and annoying other people. This is also not correct. Now let's begin. In this lesson, we're going to talk about three most common small talk topics. I cannot say we're going to talk about three most common small talk topics. When I say three most common, I need an article. I have to say the, the three most common small talk topics. So it's correct to say we're going to talk about the three most common small talk topics. So remember, when you say most, use an article. The most common, the two most common, the three most common, the four most common, etc. Use the article the. This is also not correct. And hit download button. I cannot say hit download button. I need an article. It's specific in this case, so I need to say the. Hit the download button. Hit the download button. I cannot say hit download button. This is also not correct. Then there is every chance that the other person would talk about pizza and Italy or pasta and food that are related to Italy. Pizza and pasta? 
These words are pronounced differently. The first word is not pizza. It's pizza. We cannot use the short I sound like this is. We have to use a long E sound like green beans. The word is pronounced pizza. P, the long E. Pizza. And pasta? We don't say pasta. Not in America. We say pasta. Use the short ah sound like hot and stop. Pa, pasta. So the words are pronounced pizza and pasta. Not pizza and pasta. Pizza and pasta. Example, I love Italian food. I love pizza and pasta. What about you? Do you like Italian food? Do you like pizza and pasta? Very good. This is also not correct. If the other person is from another town or another country, you could say, how is the weather in your town? Or how is the weather in your country? I cannot say another country. The word is not pronounced country. It's pronounced country. We don't use the uh sound like foot and book. We use the uh sound like cup and up and cut. This is a relaxed sound. Uh, c, country, country. And we see the TR makes a ch, ch sound like chicken plus the R, tree. Together, con, tree. So pronunciation, another country. Example, I live in the United States. What about you? Do you live in another country or do you live in the same country? Very good. So write it in the comments. Tell me what country you're from. Tell me what country you live in. Write it in the comments. This is also not correct. Now, in many types of extreme weather conditions, you will hear a sound like and you will see a light in the sky. What is that called? Well, the light is called a lightning and the sound is called a thunder. I cannot say the light is called a lightning and the sound is called a thunder. I cannot use an article with lightning. I cannot say a lightning. I cannot use an article with thunder. I cannot say a thunder. These words are not countable. Do not use articles with these words. So the light is called lightning and the sound is called thunder. No a lightning and no a thunder. Keep watching to the end of this video to practice with the difference between lightning and thunder and how to count them if you need to. This is also not correct. Number one is mild. But what is a mild weather? I cannot say what is a mild weather. The word weather is not countable. So that means I cannot use an article and say a weather or a mild weather. It's just weather or mild weather. So the question is, what is mild weather? And the answer, mild weather is weather that is not too severe. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's mild. It's mild weather. I prefer mild weather. What about you? Do you prefer mild weather? That's right. I prefer mild weather. This is also not correct. Opposite of a gust of wind is breeze. I cannot say opposite of a gust of wind is breeze. Why? Because opposite needs an article, the. I have to say the opposite. I cannot say opposite. I need the. The opposite of a gust of wind is breeze. Breeze is a countable noun. I need the article a. A breeze. Because it's countable. I can have one breeze or two breezes. That's why I need the article a. A breeze. So it's correct to say the opposite of a gust of wind is a breeze. Because a gust of wind is strong wind. And a breeze is light wind. Light wind that feels good, that's pleasant. They are opposites. So again, the opposite of a gust of wind is a breeze. Let's practice. What is the opposite of a gust of wind? That's right. The opposite of a gust of wind is a breeze. This is also not correct. Out of a sudden, everything is okay, but suddenly... I cannot say, out of a sudden, the sky was clear. Out of a sudden? The expression is, all of a sudden. All 
of a sudden. Not out of a sudden, but all. All of a sudden. All of a sudden, the sky was clear. It happened suddenly. So I use the expression, all of a sudden. Let's practice. What happened? Did the sky change? Was the sky clear all of a sudden? That's right. The sky changed. The sky was clear all of a sudden. Or I can change the order and say, all of a sudden, the sky was clear. They're both correct. We also do not say this in America. In the morning, we might expect some light showers and drizzle, so you might want to take your brolly with you. Brolly? What's a brolly? I had no idea what a brolly was when I heard this, so I had to Google it, and I found out it's British. They say brolly in British. I had never heard it before. It's an umbrella. We don't say brolly in America. We call them umbrellas. This is not a brolly. This is an umbrella. If you say the word brolly to an American, they will not know what you're talking about. Also, don't say this. For example, it's just spitting a bit, but it's not too bad. You don't need your brolly. When it's spitting outside, do you need to take your brolly? It's spitting outside? You need to take your brolly? In America, we do not say it's spitting outside. This is spitting. We do not use this to talk about rain. We say it's raining a little, it's drizzling, it's sprinkling, but we do not say it's spitting. And again, don't say brawly, not in America. We say it's sprinkling outside. You need to take your umbrella. Let's practice. Is it sprinkling outside? Do you need to take your umbrella? That's right, it's sprinkling outside. You need to take your umbrella. This is also not correct. It starts raining very heavily for 15 seconds. This is called shower. I cannot say it's called shower. Shower is countable. I can say a shower. But when I say a shower, I think of this, take a shower. But if you're talking about rain, it's more common to make it plural with an S and say showers. So it's correct to say these are called showers, referring to rain. You can say these are called showers. But if I use the article a uh, and say this is called a shower, I think about this. This is called a shower. And these are called showers, referring to rain. Let's practice. What is this called? Is this called a shower? That's right. This is called a shower. And what about these? Are these called showers? That's right. These are called showers, talking about rain. This is also not correct. And next is when you cannot see the distance very clearly. Why? Because it's foggy. Foggy. What does it mean? When there is a thick mist in the air, that white thing like a cloud, it's in the air and you cannot see very clearly, that's foggy. For example, I'm not going to drive today because it's foggy and it's dangerous. The storm will last until night when it will clear up and become foggy. It will become foggy? What is foggy? He means foggy. It's a different sound. I can't say foggy. We don't use the uh sound like cup and up. We use the aw uh sound like call, ball, log, and dog. Aw, uh, aw. Uh. The sound is back here. Fog. Foggy. It will become foggy. Example, it's very foggy today. What do you think? Is it very foggy today? That's right, it's very foggy today. Not foggy, but foggy. Also, don't say this. And now it is time for the last idiom of today. Bell the cat. What does it mean to bell the cat? This idiom means to do something difficult or risky that can benefit a group of people. What do I mean? Well, imagine you and your colleagues are not satisfied with your salary. So one of you will have to talk to the boss. Now, the boss might get angry and fire the person who's complaining. Get out! So it is a risky task, but whoever does it, the whole group will benefit. And now, 
Who will bell the cat? It means who will do it? Who will bell the cat? I think you should bell the cat. Boss likes you the most. I don't want to lose my job. Why don't you bell the cat? Don't use the expression bell the cat. I looked for it and looked for it and I found one example because nobody says it. It's an old, old expression. Don't use it. People won't know what you're talking about. Do not use the expression bell the cat. It's very old. Today we're going to learn the difference between what and which. So let's get started. First, this is not correct. Which noun means a difficult or unpleasant situation? Uh, adversity. Which noun means a comparison between one thing and another? Analogy. Which noun means an excessive amount of something? Plethora. Which noun means a general agreement? Consensus. Follow me for more. Which verb is used to say that you want to put something off because you don't want to do it right now? Procrastinate. Which verb means to make less or to make seem less important? Diminish. Which verb means to begin? Uh, to commence. Which verb means to bring a feeling or memory to mind? Evoke. Follow me for more. You look young. Which year were you born? I was born in 2005. <coughs> Which year were you born? <coughs> I was born in 1919. In this case, I cannot say which verb, and I cannot say which noun, and I cannot say which year were you born. Why not? Because we use which when there's a selection. It could be two things or many things, but you need a clear selection to use the word which when asking a question. Example, I have a clear selection. I have two things. I can say which one is a pen. This is a pen. I have a clear selection. That's when you use the word which. But I can't use it with verb because there's not a clear selection. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of verbs. So I cannot say which verb. It's what verb. And I cannot say which noun because there are thousands, maybe millions of nouns. I cannot use which. You have to say what. What noun. And I cannot say which year were you born. There's no clear selection here. I have to say what year. What year were you born. I can't use which in this case either. So example, you go to the soda fountain, and you see there's a clear selection. So I can ask you, which one do you like? Which drink do you prefer? I can use which in this case. So you see a clear selection. You can use the word which. Ask me the question. I prefer Coke. What about you? Which one do you prefer? Very good. And go ahead and write it in the comments. Write in the comments which drink you prefer. Which drink you prefer or which soda you prefer. Write it in the comments. This is also not correct. Go ahead and watch the third reel. Hey bro. Sup. You look young. Which year were you born? I was born in 2005. <coughs> which year were you born? <coughs> I was born in 1919. Your year begins with 19? Dude, you're old. So the creator says, which year were you born? Which year were you born? This is incorrect. We can either say, what year were you born in? Or we can use the more common question, when were you born? Instead of which, we need to say what? And we need to use a preposition at the end. We have to say, what year were you born in? When I ask the question, what year were you born? You can use a connector in. Some people do. You don't need to use the preposition in. You don't have to use in. What year were you born? What year were you born? Mr. Jesus Christ, kid, what year were you born? Is this what year were you born? What year were you born? 82. So I was born in 1971. What year were you born? Very good. This is also not correct. Let's look at the title of one of his latest videos. It's not correct to say, did they steal someone's idea as their own? First, we have to say someone's idea. And we need to change one more thing. It's correct to say, 
did they steal someone's idea and present it as their own. This is also not correct. It's not correct to say, in USA. We have to say, in the USA. This is also not correct. I will show you the front part of the house. What is this called that I'm standing on? This is called a driveway. Driveway, it's basically like a small road where cars can drive through. Where cars can drive through? A driveway is not a place where cars can drive through. We don't use the preposition through. And normally you don't drive in a driveway. You park. You park in a driveway. But you don't drive through a driveway. Don't use through. You drive and then you park. You park in a driveway. This is also not correct. You can park your cars on the driveway. I cannot say you can park your cars on the driveway. We use a different preposition. We say in. You park your car in the driveway, not on the driveway. Use the preposition in when talking about a driveway, not on. You can park your car in the driveway. So, you don't drive through a driveway, and you don't park on a driveway. You park in a driveway. You park your car in the driveway. Let's practice. Can you park your car in the driveway? That's right. You can park your car in the driveway. Use in, not on. This is also not correct. Or the second way is getting a loan from the bank where the bank will lend you money, you borrow this money, and then you pay off this money with a mortgage. I cannot say you borrow this money and then you pay off this money with a mortgage. When using the phrasal verb pay off, we don't talk about money. You cannot say pay off the money. You can pay off a loan, you can pay off a debt, and you can pay off a mortgage. But you cannot pay off money. When talking about money, we say pay back. You pay back the money. So remember the two phrasal verbs, pay off and pay back. We use pay off when we talk about a debt, a mortgage, or a loan. And if you talk about money, say pay back. You pay back the money. Example, he needs to pay off his mortgage. He needs to pay off the loan. He needs to pay off his debt. Let's practice. Does he need to pay off his mortgage? That's right. He needs to pay off his mortgage. Does he need to pay off his debt? That's right. He needs to pay off his debt. Does he need to pay off his loan? That's right. He needs to pay off his loan. Now let's talk about money. With money, we use pay back. Does he need to pay back the money? That's right. He needs to pay back the money. This is also not correct. But because today is 20 degrees Fahrenheit, the snow is sticking to the ground. I cannot say today is 20 degrees Fahrenheit. When I talk about temperature, I have to use the pronoun it. Today, it is 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Or I can make the contraction, it's. Today, it's 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So today, it's cold. It's really cold. It's 20 degrees Fahrenheit. That's below freezing. Let's practice. Is it cold? Is it 20 degrees Fahrenheit? That's right. It's 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Is that below freezing? That's right. That's below freezing. This is also not correct. Therefore, it's very hard to tell what is the sidewalk versus what is the ground. We don't say it's hard to tell what is the sidewalk versus what is the ground. What is the sidewalk is a direct question. We can't use a direct question here. We use whether. It's hard to tell whether it's the ground or the sidewalk. So you see the snow on the ground, and it's hard to tell whether it's the sidewalk or it's the ground. Let's practice. Is it hard to tell whether it's the sidewalk or the ground? That's right. It's hard to tell whether it's the sidewalk or the ground. This is also not correct. Because when it snows, it may turn the road to ice. 
We don't say when it snows, it may turn the road to ice. We can change it and say, the road may turn icy. After turn, we need an adjective. The road doesn't turn to ice. We cannot say it may turn the road to ice, but we can say the road or the roads may turn icy. Use the adjective icy. Let's practice. What do you think? Do you think the road may turn icy? That's right. The road may turn icy. This is also not correct. The car may skid off the road, and I don't like that happening. We don't say the car may skid off the road, and I don't like that happening. We say, I wouldn't like that to happen. We use to plus a simple verb, to happen. The car may skid off the road, and I wouldn't like that to happen. Let's practice. So, the car may skid off the road. Would you like that to happen? That's right. I wouldn't like that to happen either. This is also not correct. When it snows outside, it can be pretty annoying, especially when you drive, because when you get in the car, you'll be carrying all the snow and all the ice inside the car. We don't say, when you get in the car, you'll be carrying all the snow and all the ice inside the car. In this case, we don't say carry. We use a different verb. We say track. When you get in the car, you'll be tracking all the snow and all the ice in the car. Example, he's tracking mud in the house. So you don't want to track snow in your car. We don't use carry in this case. We use track. Let's practice. Is he tracking mud in the house? That's right. He's tracking mud in the house. This is also not correct. People put salt on the stairs or on the ground to prevent people from slipping and falling. Now I have this container full of salt and I'm going to put it on the ground. And you might be wondering, what type of salt do you use on the ground? Well, you can use table salt that's inside your house. We don't say salts. We don't put an S on the word salt. It's singular and it's not countable. Use salt. Never say salts. Always use it in a singular form. So they put salt on the ground to melt the ice. That's why they do it. Let's practice. Why do they put salt on the ground? That's right. They put salt on the ground to melt the ice. This is also not correct. What happens if you forgot to put salt on the ground? I cannot say what happens if you forgot to put salt on the ground. After if, I cannot use a past action. Because this is real. This is something real. We have to say, what happens if you forget? This is also not correct. You can tell how cold it is just through my breath. Look. <laughs> I cannot say you can tell how cold it is just through my breath. I cannot use the preposition through. I use the preposition from. You can tell how cold it is just from my breath. From looking at my breath, not through. You can also use by. You can tell how cold it is by looking at her breath. Or from. You can tell how cold it is from looking at her breath. But don't use through. Let's practice. Can you tell how cold it is by looking at her breath? That's right. You can tell how cold it is by looking at her breath. This is also not correct. This snow has not been touched. And to make one, you will lay down on the snow... We don't say on the snow. We say in the snow. You walk in the snow. You sit in the snow. You lay in the snow. But not on the snow. Example. He's walking in the snow. Or they're lying. They're lying in the snow. Let's practice. Is he walking in the snow? That's right. He's walking in the snow. Not on the snow. Are they laying in the snow? That's right, they're laying in the snow. So keep watching to continue practicing and to learn to avoid more mistakes. This is not correct. And you can start designing. You can literally build your dream kitchen on this computer and visualize how it will look like. I cannot say visualize how it will look like. Why not? If you use how, you cannot use the word like together. In this way, you cannot say visualize how it will look like. So, how do you say it correctly? Well, we have two options. One option is to change how to the question word what. Visualize what it will look like. 
Or I can use how and eliminate like. Visualize how it will look, but not visualize how it will look like. We cannot use how and like together in a sentence. So imagine your perfect house. Can you visualize how it will look? Me too. I can visualize how it will look. Can you visualize what it will look like? Me too. I can visualize what it will look like. So remember, don't use how with like together. Example, we can't say how is it like. We say what is it like. We cannot say how does it look like or how does it sound like. It's just how does it look or how does it sound. Or you can change to what and say what does it look like or what does it sound like. Just don't use how with like. Also, don't combine the way and how. You cannot say I like the way how it looks. Just say I like the way it looks. So keep watching to practice more so you can learn to avoid these common mistakes. This is not correct. Usamos above cuando no hay movimiento. Por ejemplo, I'm above the table. She's not above the table. Her feet are touching the table. So we cannot use above in this case. We use on. She's on the table. She's not above the table. We use above in different situations, not this one. Let's practice. Is she above the table or is she on the table? That's right, she's on the table. This is also not correct. Hola, soy Arianita. ¿Sabes cómo buscar trabajo en inglés? Acompáñame. Hi, are there any positions right now to work? Absolutely. You do not ask the question, are there any positions right now to work? Are there any positions to work? We do not ask the question like this. We say, are there any positions available right now? Again, are there any positions available right now? We don't use to work. We use available. And we put right now at the end of the question. Question, are there any positions available right now? And the answer is yes. There are some positions available right now. Let's practice. Are there any positions available right now? That's right, there are some positions available right now. Let's practice the question. Ask me the question. Yes, there are some positions available right now. Very good. This is also not correct. I cannot say let me know down below what was your favorite part of the video. If I make this one long question, I have to switch was and use a positive structure. It's correct to say, let me know down below what your favorite part of the video was. We have to put was after the subject. If you put was before the subject, then it's a question. But this is not a question. We have to use a positive structure. Let me know down below what your favorite part of the video was. If I ask a direct question and I start the question with what, then I can use the question structure. What was your favorite part of the video? That's a direct question and that is correct. So let me know in the comments below what the favorite part of this video was. This is not correct. Next, I'm going to tap the beverages menu. And as you can see, you can order a lot of beverages or soft drinks. I cannot say beverages menu. In this case, the word beverage is an adjective. So it has to be in a singular form. Beverage menu. This is a beverage menu. It's a menu of different drinks. Beverage is an adjective, so it has to be in a singular form. Example, I want to look at the beverage menu. What about you? Do you want to look at the beverage menu? Another example, dessert menu. We cannot put S on it and say desserts menu because it's an adjective. You have to use the singular form dessert. The dessert menu or a dessert menu. A dessert menu is one in general, and the dessert menu is the specific one for that restaurant. So example, I can tell the waiter, I want to look at the dessert menu. Let's practice. Do you want to look at the dessert menu? That's right. I want to look at the dessert menu. Very good. This is also not correct. So let's go ahead and scroll down. They have Coke products, Sprite, 
Fanta. They have some iced root beer. Here at McDonald's, they have Coke products. They have Coke, Diet Coke, Sprite, Fanta, root beer. In America, we do not pronounce the word Fanta. It is pronounced Fanta. Fanta. Use the short A ah sound. Before the N, it changes a little bit. It becomes a little more nasal in your nose. Fa, fa, fana, fana. What about the T? Well, when you have NT between vowels, you don't really hear the T. Like 20 and center. And this word too. It's more common to hear fana than fanta. Both are correct, but usually we don't pronounce the T. Fana. And we never say fanta. Never. I don't like orange fana. I think it's too sweet. It has too much sugar. What about you? Do you like orange fanta? Very good. This is also not correct. Now I'm going to go ahead and make a line at the registers to order my food there. I cannot say I'm going to go ahead and make a line. We cannot use make a line in this case. We say I'm going to go stand in line or get in line or wait in line, but not make a line. When can we use make a line? When you have more than one person, for example, a teacher is talking to a group of children and the teacher says, okay, everybody, make a line. It takes many people to make a line. But if you're talking about yourself, I'm going to go stand in line. I'm going to go wait in line or I'm going to go get in line, not make. Example, he's going to go get in line, not make a line, get in line. Let's practice. What is he going to do? Is he going to get in line? That's right. He's going to get in line. Also, we see that there's no the. You don't say get in the line, wait in the line, or stand in the line. There's no the. Keep watching until the end of this video to practice with the word line and how to use it correctly. This is also not correct. Now I'm going to order some food with the menu. We don't say, I'm going to order some food with the menu. We use a different preposition. We use the preposition from, from the menu. So it's correct to say, I'm going to order some food from the menu, not with the menu. It's not you and the menu together ordering food. You order food from a menu. In this case, from the menu. It's a specific menu at a specific place. She's going to order some food from the menu. Let's practice. Is she going to order some food from the menu? That's right. She's going to order some food from the menu, but not with the menu. This is also not correct. After finishing my meal, now I have some taste for dessert. So I'm going to order myself a frappe. We don't say I have some taste for dessert. It's possible to use taste in a countable way and say, I have a taste for dessert, but it's not common. And we cannot use some. We cannot say, I have some taste for dessert. It's only used as a countable noun, but again, it's not common. So what do you say? People say, I have a craving for dessert, or maybe I have room for dessert, but not some taste for dessert. Example, I have some room for dessert. Some space in my stomach. We say room. I have some room for dessert. Do you have any room for dessert? Very good. Or we can use craving. I have a craving for dessert. Do you have a craving for dessert? Very good. This is also not correct. And it's called drive-through because you need a car and you drive through it in a lane. And in some Latin American countries, drive-through is called automac. In other fast food restaurants, like the one next to me, Arby's, it's the same thing. It's called drive-through. I cannot say it's called drive-through. Drive-through is a countable noun, so I have to use an article, a, a drive-through. It's correct to say it's called a drive-through. You can also use the article the, the drive through for a specific one. Example, I don't like to use the drive through at this restaurant. It takes too long. And it's called a drive through Let's practice. Do you like to use the drive through 
Very good. Let's practice. What is it called? Is it called a drive through That's right. It's called a drive through We have to use an article. This is also not correct. How do you call drive through in your country? First, remember, drive through is countable. So it's a drive through And how do you call? We cannot say how do you call. When asking a question like this, and you use the verb call, we cannot use how. We have to use what. What do you call? The correct question is, what do you call a drive through in your country? We have to use the question word what, and we have to use an article for drive through A drive through What do you call a drive through in your country? I cannot say, how do you call drive through in your country? It's not right. So let me know in the comments, what do you call a drive through in your country? Put it in the comments. And keep watching for a complete explanation of why we say, what do you call, and not, how do you call. And to practice more. Keep watching to practice more. This is not correct. And then after pouring that champagne glass, I would go next to my friend or family member, and I would cheers them. It's not correct to say, I would go next to my friend or family member, and I would cheers them. Cheers is not a verb. It cannot be used as a verb. Cheers is what you say. You raise your glass and you say cheers. So what's the verb? You can say, have a toast. Have a toast with somebody. You raise your glass, you say something, and you have a toast with someone. You cannot cheers somebody. So you can say, I would have a toast with them. The first part, I would go next to my friend or family member. I guess it's correct, but it sounds strange. I would say, walk up to. I would walk up to my friend or family member and I would have a toast with them. Let's practice. So, if it were New Year's, what would you do? Would you walk up to your friend or family member and have a toast with them? That's right. I would walk up to my friend or family member and I would have a toast with them. If it were New Year's Eve. This is also not correct. So, I'm just going to buy this. This is a beautiful headband that will combine with my dress. I cannot say this is a beautiful headband that will combine with my dress. I cannot use the verb combine in this case. I can say go with. This is a beautiful headband that will go with my dress, not combine. You can also say go well with. The word well is optional. So you can say go with or go well with. And it means that they look good together. So you can say, this is a beautiful headband that will go with my dress. Or, this is a beautiful headband that will go well with my dress. You can also use the verb match. Match my dress. When you use the verb match, there's no preposition with. You cannot say match with, only match. I can say, this is a beautiful headband that will match my dress. What does it mean? It means they're the same color. So use match if they're the same color. And use go with or go well with if they just look good together. Example, her blouse goes well with her skirt. They're not the same color, but they look good together. So I can say go with or go well with. Her blouse goes with her skirt. Or I can say her blouse goes well with her skirt. Let's practice. Does her blouse go with her skirt? That's right, her blouse goes with her skirt. Does her blouse go well with her skirt? That's right. Her blouse goes well with her skirt. Now let's practice with match. Her shoes match her skirt. They're the same color, so I use the verb match. And remember, there's no preposition with, just the verb match. Her shoes match her skirt. What if I start with skirt? And I say her skirt. Then I have to change the verb and say matches, because skirt is singular. Her skirt matches her shoes. They're the same color. Let's practice. Do her shoes match her skirt? That's right. Her shoes match her skirt. Does her skirt match her shoes? That's right. Her skirt matches her shoes. So remember, when you talk about clothes, you can say go with, you can say go well with, and you can say match. But don't say combine. We don't say that in English. This is also not correct. I would say, cheers, I would tap the glass next to their glass. We cannot say, I would tap my glass next to their glass. 
next to is used to express position. The glass is next to the other glass. My glass is next to their glass. Position. But if I use the verb tap, I have to use a different preposition. We use the preposition against. I would tap my glass against their glass. Not next to. Against. So when you have a toast, you tap your glass against their glass. And you say cheers. Let's practice. What do you do when you have a toast? Do you tap your glass against their glass and say cheers? That's right. You tap your glass against their glass and you say cheers. That's how you have a toast. This is also not correct. And this is just a joyful expression to say during the new year. Cheers. It's just a joyful expression to say during the new year. During the new year? If I say during the new year, I'm talking about the whole year. During the year. During the new year. But we don't say cheers during the new year. We say it on New Year's Eve, on that one night. So I can say it's just a joyful expression to say on New Year's Eve. Or I can say it's just a joyful expression to ring in the new year. We have that expression too, to ring in the new year. That's what you do at midnight. I say cheers, and I say Happy New Year on New Year's Eve. I say Happy New Year to ring in the new year, not during the new year. Let's practice. What do you say on New Year's Eve? Very good. What do you say to ring in the new year? Very good. This is also not correct. Before ending this video, I'm going to teach you all, what is a New Year's resolution? You cannot say, I'm going to teach you, what is a New Year's resolution? What is a New Year's resolution is a direct question. But if you say, I'm going to teach you, we have to change the structure. We have to use a positive structure. So it's correct to say, I'm going to teach you what a New Year's resolution is. I put is after. Or if I ask the question, do you know? I have to use a positive structure. Do you know what a New Year's resolution is? And you can answer positive and say, yes, I know what a New Year's resolution is with a positive structure. Or if you say, no, I don't know what a New Year's resolution is. Again, use a positive structure not a question structure. If I say what is, that's a question structure for a direct question. But these are not direct questions. Let's practice. Do you know what a New Year's resolution is? Very good. This is also not correct. A New Year's resolution is the promise we make for ourselves for the new year. I cannot say a New Year's resolution is a promise we make for ourselves on New Year's. If I talk about promise and I use promise as a noun, we don't use the preposition for. We use a different preposition. We use the preposition to. So it's correct to say a New Year's resolution is a promise we make to ourselves on New Year's. You make a promise to somebody, not for somebody. Example, when I make a promise to somebody, I try to keep it. Let's practice. When you make a promise to somebody, do you keep it? Do you try to keep it? That's right. When I make a promise to somebody, I keep it or I try to keep it. So remember, you make a promise to somebody, not for somebody. What about the verb promise? When we use the verb promise, there's no preposition. Example, I promise you that I will do it. There's no preposition with the verb. But the noun, if you make a promise, use the preposition to. You make a promise to somebody. This is also not correct. So if you're working a lot and you're always busy, you can place and set some time to spend time with your family. You can place and set some time to spend time with your family is not correct. First, the verb place and set, we cannot use for time. You don't place some time. You cannot set some time. We have a phrasal verb. The phrasal verb is set aside. Set aside. You hear the T change to a fast D. Set a, set a, set aside. You set aside some time. You don't place time. You don't set time. You set aside some time. And it's a separable phrasal verb. So I can say, you set aside some time 
or you set some time aside. Whichever is easier. They're both correct. So let's change it. You can set aside some time to spend time with your family. There's a little problem here. It sounds redundant. Redundant. What is redundant? It means to do or say something more than what is necessary. And we see the word time twice, two times. It sounds redundant. So let's eliminate the word time, the second one, and say, you can set aside some time to spend with your family. That's the best way to say it. So that's a good New Year's resolution. In the new year, I'm going to set aside some time to spend with my family. Let's practice. What about you? Are you going to set aside some time to spend with your family? Very good. This is not correct. And another thing you may need besides sunscreen are sunglasses. I cannot say another thing you may need besides sunscreen are sunglasses. We cannot use are in this case. I know what you're thinking. Sunglasses. It's plural. You should use are. But the verb does not depend on the object. It depends on the subject. So if I say another thing you may need, thing is the subject. And it's singular. So we have to use the verb is. So it's correct to say, another thing you may need besides sunscreen is sunglasses. We have to use is in the sentence because the subject is singular. So another thing you might need is sunglasses. The idea? You might need a lot of things. And another thing you might need is sunglasses. Let's practice. What's another thing you might need? That's right. Another thing you might need is sunglasses. This is also not correct. And if you're a man, you will use these. These are swimming trunks. I cannot say if you're a man, you will use these. These are swimming trunks. We don't use the verb use when we talk about clothes. We use a different verb. We use wear. So it's correct to say if you're a man, you will wear these. These are swimming trunks. So remember, we don't use our clothes, we wear our clothes. I cannot say I'm using the sweater. I'm wearing the sweater. So I'm wearing a sweater. What are you wearing? Very good. Also, don't say this. We have some staplers that you can use for wood. These are way different from the ones in your school. These will be more tactable to the wood panels. She said it's tactable. But what is tactable? I cannot find this word in any dictionary. I don't know what it means. I don't know what it is. So don't use the word tactable. I'm not sure if it exists. This is also not correct. So as you can see, we have our wrench set that you can use to wrench in things. These are wrenches, but I cannot wrench in anything. There's no phrasal verb wrench in. There's a verb wrench, but it means something different. If I'm talking about these wrenches, use the verb turn. You turn bolts and you turn nuts with wrenches. Or you can use the verb tighten. You tighten bolts. You tighten nuts with a wrench. Or I can use the verb loosen to make it loose. You can loosen a bolt or you can loosen a nut with a wrench. But there's no phrasal verb wrench in. It doesn't exist. This is also not correct. So this is a hammer that you hammer nails into pieces of wood or other things. And this is a mallet. So similar use, similar thing to a hammer, but it's called differently. Hammer, mallet. I cannot say it's called differently. I cannot use the adverb differently with the verb call in this case, when you're giving the name of something. So if you have something with two different names, we say it's called something different, or it's called something else. Don't say it's called differently. It's not correct. Example, these are called reading glasses, and these are called something else. These are called something different. These are called sunglasses. Let's practice. Are these called something else? Are these called something different? That's right. These are called something else. These are called something different. I cannot say these are called differently. 
This is also not correct. This is a rug and it's really soft and it's different from a carpet because it's just only one big rectangle. Whereas a carpet will take over your whole entire floor of your house. I cannot say the carpet will take over your whole entire floor. We don't use the phrasal verb take over. We use the verb cover. The carpet will cover your whole entire floor. And you don't have to say whole entire. They mean the same thing. So the carpet will cover your whole floor. That's how it's different from a rug. A rug will not cover your whole floor. So let's practice. Will the carpet cover your whole floor? That's right. The carpet will cover your whole floor. What about the rug? Will the rug cover your whole floor? That's right. The rug will not cover your whole floor. So what is take over? What is the phrasal verb take over? It means to take control. Usually governments and countries, they take over. Or maybe companies. Someone can take over a company. It means to take control. Take total control. Take over. Carpets don't do that. Example, Elon Musk took over Twitter. I don't know why, but he did. Elon Musk took over Twitter. He took control of the company. He bought it. Let's practice. Did Elon Musk take over Twitter? That's right. Elon Musk took over Twitter. And he changed the name. This is not correct. But first, you need to know the difference between a city and a downtown. I cannot say the difference between a city and a downtown. Why not? Because downtown is not countable. I cannot say a downtown. One downtown or two downtowns. It's not a countable word. You can say a downtown area. So you can say the difference between a city and a downtown area. But not a downtown. Let's talk about downtown. It's an interesting word because it has different variations. For example, I can say the restaurant is downtown with no preposition. Or I can say the restaurant is in downtown. Both are correct. And if you use a verb with direction and movement like go, normally we say go to, but you don't have to. You can just say go downtown. We're going downtown to go shopping. And if you talk about the name of the city, you put it before the name of the city. For example, downtown Dallas. Downtown Miami. We're going to downtown Miami. In that case, we use to. But if you just say downtown, you don't need to. We're going downtown. But never a downtown. Let's practice. Is this a downtown area? That's right. This is a downtown area. In this case, we can say a because you have one area. Where is the restaurant? Is the restaurant downtown? That's right. The restaurant is downtown. Where are they going? Are they going downtown? That's right. They're going downtown. Is this downtown Miami or downtown Dallas? That's right. This is downtown Dallas. This is also not correct. What is a cruise? A cruise is a large ship and you will take a voyage or a journey on the sea. I cannot say a cruise is a large ship. A cruise is not a large ship. A cruise is a ride. When you ride on a ship, that's a cruise. So you can use the verb take. We're going to take a cruise. Or you can use the phrasal verb go on. We're going to go on a cruise. It's the trip. It's not the ship. So what do you call the ship? The ship is called a cruise ship. Let's practice. Is this a cruise ship? That's right. This is a cruise ship. Are they going to take a cruise? That's right. They're going to take a cruise. Or I can use go on. Are they going to go on a cruise? That's right. They're going to go on a cruise. This is also not correct. How do you call this appliance that would go inside your kitchen? Now, how do you call this thing where you listen to music? I cannot say, 
how do you call this appliance or how do you call this thing? In this situation, when we use the verb call, we cannot start the question with how. We have to start the question with what. So it's correct to say, what do you call this appliance? Or, what do you call this thing? We cannot say, how do you call in this situation? You can also use passive voice and say, what is it called? What is this thing called? And you answer, it's called an appliance. Or it's called a stove. Use passive voice for the answer. So, example, what do you call this appliance? And I answer, it's called a stove. Let's practice. What do you call this appliance? That's right, it's called a stove. So keep watching until the end of this video to practice more with the difference between how do you call and what do you call, and how to say it correctly. This is also not correct. So this one right here is around $700, and it has buttons right here where you can control the heat. I cannot say it has buttons right here where you can control the heat. The problem is, they're not buttons. You don't push them. You push buttons. These are knobs. If you turn them, they're not buttons. You turn knobs. You turn the knob to control the heat. So it's correct to say, it has knobs right here where you can control the heat. Because you turn them, we have to call them knobs. They're not buttons. You push buttons and you turn knobs. We see the word knob has a K, and the K is silent. Don't pronounce the K. Start with the N sound. Knob. One knob, two knobs. The stove has knobs, and you turn the knobs to control the heat. Let's practice. Does the stove have knobs? That's right, the stove has knobs. Do you turn the knobs to control the heat? That's right, you turn the knobs to control the heat. This is also not correct. And if you would see that picture, it would look like you were right next to the thing you were taking a picture of. I cannot say if you would see that picture, it would look like you were right next to the thing you were taking a picture of. That's a long sentence, but that's not really the problem. The problem is would. If you would see that picture, it would look like you were right next to the thing you were taking a picture of. After if in the sentence, I cannot say would. This structure is called second conditional, and after if, we have to use a past action. We cannot use would after if in this sentence. We have to say if you saw. If you saw this picture, we have to use saw, the past of C. If you saw that picture, it would look like you were right next to the thing you were taking a picture of. Because it's an imaginary situation, it's not real, we use past after if to express the action that is not real. If you saw that picture. I cannot say if you would see that picture. Example. I cannot say if I would have a lot of money, I would buy a big house. Another imaginary situation. After if, we use the past verb. It's correct to say if I had. If I had a lot of money, I would buy a big house. Let's practice. If you had a lot of money, would you buy a big house or a small house? That's right. If I had a lot of money, I would buy a big house. For example, if I were a millionaire, I would buy a big house. We use the past, were. Because it's not real, we have to use were for everybody. If I were, if he were, if she were, we're not supposed to use was. But if you make a mistake and you use was in the structure, it's okay. A lot of Americans do this too, so it's kind of acceptable now. But the rule says we're supposed to use were. It sounds better. If I were a millionaire, I would buy a big house. What about you? If you were a millionaire, would you buy a big house or a small house? Me too. If I were a millionaire, I would buy a big house. This is also not correct. If you buy something, you will go to the checkout counter and check out your items. I cannot say you will go to the checkout counter and check out your items. It's correct to use checkout as an adjective and say checkout counter. That's what it's called. It's called a checkout counter, or the, the checkout counter. But I cannot say check out your items. 
we cannot use an object with this phrasal verb. You go to the checkout counter and you check out. You cannot use the object. You cannot say your items. You just say, you go to the checkout counter and you check out. You can ask the person at the store, can I check out here? Sure, you can check out here. But you cannot say, can I check out my items here? There's no object with this phrasal verb. If you use an object, you have to say buy or pay for. I need to pay for my items. I need to buy my items. Or I just need to check out. Because if you say, I need to check out my items, then it makes you think of another phrasal verb, check out, which means to look at something. Example, check out my new glasses. Check out. It means to look at something if you have an object. If I buy a new car, I can say, hey, come and check out my new car. That's a different idea. And that's why when you say check out to mean buy your items or pay for your items, do not use an object. Just say, I need to check out. Where can I check out? But if you buy a new car and you want your friends to look at your new car, you say, come outside and check out my new car. That's different. That's when we use check out plus an object to look at something. So examples. You check out at the checkout counter, but you don't check out your items. You just check out. Again, you can check out at the checkout counter. Let's practice. Can you check out at the checkout counter? That's right. You can check out at the checkout counter. Example with check out plus an object, meaning to look at, I just bought a new car. Do you want to check out my new car? And you say, sure, I'd love to check out your new car. Let's practice. I just bought a new car. Do you want to go check out my new car? Very good. So remember, keep watching to practice more with the difference between how do you call and what do you call. Remember, we don't say how do you call. Keep watching to practice more. First, this is not correct. Mm. This slushy and this popcorn is delicious. Talking about popcorn, how do you guys call popcorn in your country? It's not correct to say, how do you guys call popcorn? And this is also not correct. Oh yeah, they can even proofread your assay. How's the app called? I want to check it out. Hi, native. Oh, wow. It's not correct to say, how's the app called? And here's another teaching video with the title, here's how we call each finger. But it's not correct to say, here's how we call each finger. As you can see, this is a very common mistake made by non-native speakers. So how do we say it correctly? Well, if you want to know the name of something, it's not correct to say, how do you call it? We have to use the question word, what? We have to say, what do you call it? We cannot use the question word, how, in this case. What do you call that? What do you call that? What do you call it? Yeah? What do you call it? That hat, what do you call it? What do you call it when the assassins accuse the assassin? I'm trying to, what do you call it? What do you call it, a fixation, psychosis, have you thought of that? What do you call that, a goose? She gave it all up to live with a bunch of women and uh, what do you call it, a, 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 a sorority. What do you call it, though, a success? The fact that you're here and doing as well as you're doing gives me, what do you call it, a motivation, huh, to stay alive? So let's look at the question and the answer. The question is, what do you call it? Or I can use passive voice and say, what is it called? I can also make the contraction, what's, and say, what's it called? Oh, this one's good. What's it called again? What's it called again? What is it called? They even got a whole, um, what is it called? So that marbles thing that you were so very smart about, what is it called again? What is it called? The cross-country classic? Uh, Rita, please continue your restoration using Norman's, uh, what is it called again? What's it called again? Shake Shack? When you answer this question, we have to answer with passive voice. It's called. Exactly. It's called first jumping. It's delicious. It's called a Malaga cooler. It's called a gravity drive. It's called a knockout mechanism. It's called the masses. It's called a sand walk. Yes, they do, and horses, and pigs, and goats, and sheep. And it's called animal husbandry. It's called a rock blanket. Or if I have something in my hand, I say this. What do you call this? Or I could use passive voice and say, what is this called? And the answer, 
It's called a plush toy. This is called a plush toy. Let's practice. What do you call this? That's right. This is called a plush toy. Now let's practice the question. Ask me the question. Very good. This is called a plush toy. What if you have two? For example, scissors. Question. What do you call these? These are called scissors. Or I can ask the question, what are these called? Or what are they called? They are called scissors. Let's practice. What are these called? That's right. These are called scissors. Now, ask me the question. They're called scissors. Very good. So when can we use the question word how? We can use how with questions like how do you pronounce? How do you say? And how do you spell? With these verbs, we use the question word how. How do you, how do you pronounce that one? How do you pronounce your name? How do you pronounce this? Uh, and we were curious. Uh, how do you pronounce it? Now, how do you pronounce your name? Example, how do you pronounce your last name? I answer, it's pronounced Liddell. Let's practice. How do you pronounce your last name? Very good. And with the question, how do you spell your last name? I answer, it's spelled L-I-D-D-E-L-L. -L. Hey, Anne, how do you spell freckles? How do you spell zucchini? So how do you spell all these words anyway? How do you spell buter, by the way? Peace. How do you spell that? Okay, and how do you spell that? T-R-O-Y. Hey, Josie, how do you spell ugly? How do you spell that? Yes. How do you spell that? Let's practice. How do you spell your last name? Very good. Let's practice with how do you say. I'm not so young anymore, and um, how do you say a little uh, incontinent? How do you say no? Oh my gosh. I know. How do you say that in Espanol? How do you say that in French? How do you say that you're a loving person with this on my face, you yeah. know? How do you say this? How do you say this in your native language? Very good. Let's also look at the difference between a direct question and an indirect question. If I say, what do you call it? That's a direct question. But if I say, do you know? I have to change the structure. Do you know what it's called? I cannot say, do you know what is it called? I cannot use a question structure. I have to use a positive structure after do you know. Do you know what it's called? I know what it's called. I don't know what it's called. You know what it's called? What? New tweeter ends. Oh, I know what it's called. But you can't do this. I know what it's called. Let's practice. Do you know what it's called? That's right. I know what it's called. Ask me the question. Yes, I know what it's called. It's called a plush toy. Very good. Now let's practice the negative answer. Do you know what it's called? I don't know what it's called. Do you know what it's called? That's right. I don't know what it's called either. Very good. Keep watching to learn to avoid another common mistake with the verb call. Today we're talking about an important mistake to avoid using the verb call. I can say, what do they call him? They call him a troublemaker, but I cannot say how do they call him. When using call, you make the question with what. What do they call him? And also, when you use call, don't use like. They call him like that. No like when you use the verb call. So, I say, why do they call him that? Not, why do they call him like that? Why do they call him that? They call him that because he causes problems. They call him a troublemaker because he causes problems. So again, with the verb call, do not use like. You cannot say they call him like that. You say they call him that. Question, why do they call him that? They call him that because he causes problems. He makes trouble. That's why they call him that. Let's practice. What do they call him? That's right, they call him a troublemaker. Why do they call him that? That's right, they call him that because he causes problems. He makes trouble. That's why they call him that. 
So remember, when using call, use the question word what, never how, and don't put the action call with like. You cannot use the two words together, call and like. You can say speak like that and talk like that, but you cannot say call him like that. It's call him that. A common mistake I've heard from my students is this, the way how I like it. Example, they cook the food the way how I like it is not correct. We cannot put the way and how together. We have to eliminate one. So you can say they cook the food the way I like it, or you can say they cook the food how I like it. But you cannot say they cook the food the way how I like it together. You cannot use the way and how together because they mean basically the same thing. For emphasis, you can use exactly or just. Example, they cook it just the way I like it. Let's practice. Do they cook the food just the way you like it? That's right. They cook it just the way I like it. Example, she's a good cook, so I can say, I like the way she cooks. Or I can say, I like how she cooks. But I cannot say, I like the way how she cooks. I cannot use the way and how together. I have to eliminate one. So I say, I like the way she cooks. Let's practice. Do you like the way she cooks? Very good. I like the way she cooks too. So remember, you cannot say the way how. You cannot say the way how I like it. You cannot use the way and how together. You have to eliminate one and use just one. The way or how. And now let's talk about this video. It's called 15 words you mispronounce. Let's look at the thumbnail. It's not correct to say address, but it's not true. If it's a noun, you can say address or you can say address. You can stress the first syllable, address, or you can stress the second syllable, address. Both are correct. What's your address? Or what's your address? Both are correct. If it's a verb, you have to stress the second syllable, address. They address the problem in the meeting. So remember, it's always correct to say address. You don't have to worry if it's a noun or if it's a verb. It's always correct to say address. It's not a mistake. It sounds natural. And you don't have to worry if it's a noun or a verb. It's always correct. And now let's listen to the clip from this video. Our next example is the word address or address. Now, which one is correct? Well, it depends what we're talking about in the sentence and it depends where you're from. Because in the United States, that's where I'm from, we say address and that's a noun, but we say address and that's a verb. It's not true. If it's a noun, Americans say both. They say, what's your address? Or, what's your address? Let's listen to some examples. What's your address? Maybe we could talk this over. What's his address, please? She wants what? to go home. What's her address? Okay. Okay. What's his address? What's her address? We'll get the addresses of every customer that comes in the store for a roll of film, and we'll ask them what they want, what they need changed. What's your address? You, you know, the girl, what's her address? What's your address, Richard? What's her address in Richmond? If I see him, I'll stall him. Now, what's his address? Can you find him for me? Okay, well, let's start uh, first things first. What's his address? 88 Falcon Road. So remember, if it's a noun, you can say address or address. If it's a verb, you have to say address. You have to stress the second syllable. For a complete explanation of how native speakers use this word, check out the link in the description. And just because you see someone wearing an American flag shirt or an American flag hat, it doesn't mean they can teach you correct American pronunciation. And in this video, I'm going to tell you how to pronounce country adjectives that end with I-A-N. Armenian. Armenian. Armenian? It's not correct to say Armenian. You have to use the long E. Armenian. The country is Armenia, and people from Armenia are Armenians, and they speak Armenian not Armenian. Armenian brandy. I'm Armenian. 
That's some Armenian guy with a history of mental health problems. Which is something, considering how long it took him to get over my not being Armenian. This is also not correct. I cannot say on the expense of another human being. I have to use a different preposition. I have to use the preposition at. At the expense of another human being is correct. Let's hear some examples of at the expense. It's an important part of my family's legacy, but not at the expense of people's lives. When we put resorts near small towns, they do fine on paper, but it's usually at the expense of the businesses that already exist. Of course I am, but not at the expense of people's lives. First at the expense of the Hawaiians and now the Chinese. I'm not against technology, Doctor. I'm against the men who deify it at the expense of human truth. And at the expense of the company enriched himself. Not at the expense of protecting the homeland you can Wait a minute, why is it a good thing? So remember, we cannot say on the expense of another human being. We have to say at the expense of another human being. Remember, use the preposition at. This is also not correct. I cannot say, OMG, this is so a free content platform, not a school. Talking about YouTube. I cannot use so. Why not? Because I have a noun. I have a noun after. So I cannot use so, I have to use such. It's correct to say this is such a free content platform, not a school. I have to use such because I have platform. That's the noun. If you have a noun after, you cannot use so. You have to use such. Let's hear some examples with such a. So Eric's not such a nice guy after all. And he is such a nice guy. He was pissed that there were seven of us living in such a tiny house. Dana, I don't think that's such a good idea. I'm in such a good mood, I don't think even he could ruin it. I don't think that's such a good idea. You're such a nice guy, Jay Leno. You know, for being such a free spirit, you were surprisingly uptight. Example. I can say the weather is so nice because I have an adjective nice. The weather is so nice. I don't have a noun after. I have only an adjective. So it's correct to say the weather is so nice. But what if I say it's so nice weather? I cannot say this. I have to say it's such nice weather because weather is a noun and it's after. If you have a noun after, you have to use such. It's such nice weather. And what if I say day? I cannot say it's so a nice day. I have to say such. It's such a nice day. And now we see the article a. Uh. It's such a nice day. Because day is a countable noun, I have to use the article a. Uh. It's such a nice day. But when I say weather, weather's not countable. So there's no article. It's such nice weather. So I can say the weather is so nice. I can say it's such nice weather. And I can say it's such a nice day. Let's practice. How's the weather? Is it so nice? That's right, the weather is so nice. Is it such nice weather? That's right, it's such nice weather. Is it such a nice day? That's right, it's such a nice day. So remember, it's not correct to say this is so a free content platform, not a school. We have to say this is such. This is such a free content platform, not a school. Don't say this. Memorizing words separately is worthless, to my opinion. Yeah, burn. It's like a little negative, to my opinion. A little harsh. That's right. Don't say to my opinion. Say in my opinion. In my opinion is correct and sounds good and sounds natural. To my opinion sounds wrong and strange and weird. You might find some examples of to my opinion on the internet, but it doesn't sound like correct English. It sounds wrong. It sounds strange. So if you want to sound correct and natural, say in my opinion. And if you want to sound wrong and strange, say to my opinion. The choice is yours. Let's hear some examples. In my opinion, it took much longer. Nine, ten minutes. In my opinion, you're lucky to be sitting here today. Look, in my opinion, it can't be done. Doctor, in your opinion, can our son lead a normal life? What, in your opinion, is the actual problem? In his opinion, that was those who had different colored skin, were religious, 
or were handicapped. So remember, don't say to my opinion, say in my opinion. One of our viewers sent us a message asking about this difficult structure. They asked if the structure in this clip was correct. Let's listen to the clip. Because then it's going to prevent from her to feel free when she's working on a roll. We cannot say it's going to prevent from her to feel free. We have to use a different structure. We say it's going to prevent her from feeling free. After prevent, we need to have an object. It's going to prevent her. Her is the object. Then we need a preposition from. It's going to prevent her from feeling free. After the preposition from, we have to use a gerund. That's a verb with ing used as an object. Feeling is the gerund. After from, we need a gerund. Feeling. It's going to prevent her from feeling free. This is an important structure because we use it not only for prevent, but also for stop and keep. With all three verbs, we use the same structure. Example, prevent someone from doing something or stop someone from doing something. And also keep, keep someone from doing something. We use the same structure for all three verbs. Let's hear some examples with prevent. I have a duty to my people and I will not allow anyone to prevent me from carrying it out. I'm not trying to prevent her from growing up. I'm trying to prevent her from killing herself. Our whole system's designed to prevent them from making contact. What you're saying, Kevin, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there's nothing to prevent her from playing, officially, right? Well, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> this may prevent me from being your maid of honor on Sunday. <laughs> we should probably prevent her from doing that. Let's practice with prevent. Why do people take vitamin C? People take vitamin C to help prevent them from getting sick. They say it can help prevent you from getting sick. That's right. People take vitamin C to prevent them from getting sick. Let's practice. Why do people take vitamin C? That's right. People take vitamin C to prevent them from getting sick. Another example. What does the Border Patrol do? The Border Patrol prevents immigrants from entering the country. That's their job. They prevent immigrants from entering the country. Let's practice. What does the Border Patrol do? That's right. They prevent immigrants from entering the country. Another example. Car alarms. Why do people have car alarms? It's to prevent thieves from stealing their car. That's the reason. It's to prevent thieves from stealing their car. Let's practice. Why do people have car alarms? That's right. It's to prevent thieves from stealing their car. Let's hear some examples with stop. And that's when I realized making fun of Carolyn Kraft wouldn't stop her from beating me in this contest. And uh, nothing, nobody can stop me from making it happen. Elvis was an artist, but that didn't stop him from joining the service in time of war. If, if it's not going to stop him from killing people. To stop us from fighting. We're fighting? Why? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, but you can't stop us from getting legally divorced. Example, I don't think vitamin C can stop you from getting sick. I don't think it works 100% of the time. What do you think? Do you think vitamin C will stop you from getting sick? That's right. I don't think vitamin C will stop you from getting sick. Example, the Border Patrol. What's their job? Their job is to stop immigrants from entering the country. Let's practice. What does the Border Patrol do? What's their job? That's right. Their job is to stop immigrants from entering the country. And why do people have car alarms? It's to stop thieves from stealing their car. That's the reason. Let's practice. Why do people have car alarms? That's right. It's to stop thieves from stealing their car. Now let's hear some examples with keep. They uh, help keep boats safe and keep us from crashing into the rocks. 
The mind holds on to painful memories for a reason, trying to keep us from making the same mistakes over and over. Like I was disgusting for faking, for doing the only thing I could think of to keep him from hitting me again. I don't see why you couldn't just give me a pill to keep me from dreaming. There was so little left of him. They had to fill the coffin with cotton balls to keep him from rattling around. Fiction created by people to uh, keep them from jumping out of windows. <laughs> Example, I don't think vitamin C will keep you from getting sick. What do you think? Do you think vitamin C will keep you from getting sick? That's right. I don't think vitamin C will keep you from getting sick. Example, what does the Border Patrol do? They keep people, they keep immigrants from entering the country. Let's practice. What does the Border Patrol do? That's right. They keep immigrants from entering the country. And why do people have car alarms? It's to keep thieves from stealing their car. That's why people have car alarms. It's to keep thieves from stealing their car. Let's practice. Why do people have car alarms? That's right. It's to keep thieves from stealing their car. So remember, prevent, stop, and keep all have the same meaning and they all use the same structure. After the verb, you need an object plus the preposition from plus a gerund. One of our viewers had a question about this pronunciation of the word continue. My team and I will continue to work hard to make content that you like. It's not pronounced continue. It's pronounced continue. We have to use a short sound I like this is. We have the letter I, which makes the sound I, and it's a stressed syllable. Continue. We cannot change that sound. We cannot say continue. We have to use the I sound, continue. Example, if you continue to practice English, your English will get better. Let's practice. If you continue to practice English, will your English get better? That's right. If you continue to practice English, your English will get better. This is also not correct. And today we have something special happening. We're doing our course of intermediate English until she gets used to using a laptop. After get used to, we need to say ing. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. We cannot pronounce ing like ing, ing. There's no g sound. It's ing. We have two pronunciations for ing. I can say working or working, working, which is the N sound. So the two sounds, I have ing, where I make the sound in my nose, mm, 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 working, or I can make the N sound, working, working, but I cannot say working, working. This is not correct. It sounds strange. So keep watching to learn all the details about the pronunciation of NG. Today we're learning all the pronunciations of NG together. When you see NG together, it can have different pronunciations. So let's take a closer look. When you see NG at the end of a word, it makes a nasal sound. It makes a sound in your nose, like this. Mm, mm. There's no G sound when you see NG at the end of a word. It makes a sound mm, like young, strong, and working. When you have ING at the end, it makes a sound mm, working, not working G. There's no G sound. It's the sound mm, working. Now, sometimes when you see ing, you hear workin, workin. That's also correct pronunciation. You can say working or workin with the n sound. Now, what happens when we change young and strong to younger and stronger? Or the youngest, the strongest. When we change these adjectives with er or with est, we're going to pronounce the g sound, the hard g. So it's Younger, ger, with a g sound. Stronger, the youngest, again with the g sound. The strongest, gist, the strongest. Example, he's younger than his brother. He's also the youngest in his family. Let's practice. Is he younger than his brother? That's right, he's younger than his brother. Is he the youngest in the family? That's right, he's the youngest in the family. But what if I change these words? I can change hang to 
hanger. And I can change sing to singer. When I change these words with ER, I don't pronounce the G sound. It's just the nasal M linked together with the ER. Together, hanger. Mer, hanger. There's no G sound. I cannot say hanger. I cannot say singer. It's hanger and singer. Example, he has hangers in his closet. Let's practice. Does he have hangers in his closet? That's right. He has hangers in his closet. Not hangers, but hangers. Example, she's a good singer. She's a really good singer. Let's practice. Is she a good singer? That's right. She's a good singer. Not singer, but singer. Now let's look at NG when we have an L after it. When you have an L after it, it makes the G sound, like English. Make the hard G, English. Or jungle, tangle, and angle. These are pronounced with the hard G sound. Example, monkeys live in the jungle. Make the hard G sound, jungle. So you have the nasal M sound and the hard G, jungle, goal. Monkeys live in the jungle. Let's practice. Where do monkeys live? Do they live in the jungle? That's right. Monkeys live in the jungle. Let's practice with tangle. I can say she has a lot of tangles in her hair. Or I can describe her hair and say her hair is tangled using the nasal M sound and the hard G, tang, G, G, tangled. Her hair is very tangled. Let's practice. Is her hair tangled? That's right. Her hair is very tangled. Let's look at this word. Mingle. Using the nasal M sound and the hard G together. Mingle. Mingle. Mingle is a verb. It means to talk to people, especially at a party. If you're at a party and you're not talking to people, I'll say, go mingle. You need to mingle. You need to go talk to people at the party. He's at the party, but he's not talking to anybody. Does he need to go mingle? That's right. He needs to go mingle. Now let's compare these two words. We have angle, spelled L-E, making the nasal sound M and the hard G. Angle. This is a right angle. It's 90 degrees, so we call it a right angle. And then we have, with E-L, angel. In this word, the G makes a J, J sound, like jump and juice. Together with the N, a regular N sound, not the nasal N, but the regular N. Angel. 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 This is an angel. Let's practice. Is this a right angle? That's right. This is a right angle. Use the nasal M plus the hard G. Angle. Angle. This is a right angle. Let's look at more words where you have NG in the middle and you make the hard G sound. Like language. Language. You have the nasal M sound. Lang. And the hard G. Guage. Language. Language. I have one language, two languages. I speak two languages. How many languages do you speak? Very good. Also this word, single, single. The NG makes the nasal N sound plus the hard G. Single, single. I'm not single, I'm married. What about you? Are you single? Very good. Also, we have these two words, hungry and hunger. They also make the same sound with the nasal sound and the hard G. Hunger. Hungry. Remember the difference. Hungry is a description. I'm hungry. I want some food. And hunger is a noun. It's the thing. Hunger is a problem for many people. They don't have enough food. They have to live with hunger. It's a noun. And we have this word, tongue. The U-E at the end is silent, so we pronounce it like young, tongue. You have only the nasal sound, mm. There's no G. It's just the sound, mm, tongue. 
This is my tongue. Tongue. Example. He's sticking out his tongue. Well, I think it's a boy. It's an emoji. He's sticking out his tongue. Let's practice. What is he doing? Is he sticking out his tongue? That's right. He's sticking out his tongue. And when we have ER after NG, we have N-G-E-R, it can be pronounced different ways. Example, danger and anger. So with danger, we hear the J sound. Danger. There's no nasal sound. There's no N. It's a regular N. Danger. With the J sound, like jump and juice. Danger. But we see this word, and it's anger. Let's talk about anger. We have the nasal N sound plus the hard G, the G sound. Together, anger. Anger. Anger is a noun, and angry is a description. I can say he's very angry. We use the nasal sound, N, plus the hard G. Angry. He's very angry. He needs to control his anger. Anger is a noun. He needs to control his anger. Let's practice. Is he angry? That's right. He's very angry. Does he need to control his anger? That's right. He needs to control his anger. And we can compare these two words. Ginger and finger. The NG is in the middle, it's before ER, but you have different pronunciations. With ginger, we use the J sound, like juice and jump, J, 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 and the regular N, gin, jur, ginger. People like to drink tea with ginger. Let's practice. Do you like tea with ginger? Very good. And finger, finger. We see the nasal ng sound, ng, plus the hard g, the g, fing, ng, 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 g, g, gr, finger. I have ten fingers. Let's practice. How many fingers do you have? Very good. This is a plunger. Plunger. Use the regular n and the j, j sound, like juice. Plunger. This is a plunger. I keep my plunger in the bathroom. What about you? Where do you keep your plunger? Very good. I keep my plunger in the bathroom too. And this word is stranger. I can use it two ways. I can say, don't talk to strangers. Strangers are people that you don't know. So I tell my children not to talk to strangers. I can also compare and say, he's strange. But this other guy is stranger, meaning he's more strange. I use er to compare. He's stranger. He's stranger than his friend. It means he's more strange. He's weirder. He's stranger than his friend. Let's practice with stranger as a person. One stranger, two strangers. I tell my children not to talk to strangers. What about you? Do you tell your children not to talk to strangers? Very good. Usually when you see N-G-E, it makes the N-G sound. Like orange or exchange. You make the N sound, not the nasal sound, just N. And the J, like juice. J -j -j. Together, orange. Orange. Or exchange. Change or exchange. You have the same sound. N-G. This word too, challenge makes the same sound, the regular N plus the J sound. Challenge. What is a challenge? A challenge is something that's difficult but good for you. Like practicing English, learning English. Learning a second language is a big challenge. It's difficult but good for you. Let's practice. Is it a challenge to learn a second language? That's right. It's a challenge to learn a second language. Now let's talk about NG plus S. When you have S after NG, it makes the nasal sound M, mm, but it also makes a little G sound, but not a hard, strong G. These are bangs. 
bangs. There's a little g, but it's not bangs. G, it's softer. Bangs. I don't have bangs. I don't have hair to hear. Those are called bangs. She has bangs. Let's practice. Does she have bangs? That's right. She has bangs. And you can have one fang or two fangs. These are fangs. A snake has fangs. It's the two teeth. The two sharp teeth are called fangs. Use a long A plus the nasal sound, mm, and a soft G. Fangs. Fangs. And the S is making a zebra sound, zzz, but it's soft. Fangs. Fangs. The snake has fangs. Let's practice. Does the snake have fangs? That's right. The snake has fangs. One thing, two things. So NG plus S, it's a soft G. I have many things to do today. I have a lot of things to do today. Things. What about you? Do you have a lot of things to do today? That's right. I have a lot of things to do today. And we have this word, cling, cling. It's a verb. It means stick to or hang on to, hold on to, cling. If I change it with an S, I hear clings, clings. It's a soft G. Not clings, but clings. Example, the baby. The baby clings to his mother. He holds on to his mother. The baby clings to his mother. Let's practice. Does the baby cling to his mother? That's right. The baby clings to his mother. I can change the word cling with Y and make an adjective. Clingy. Clingy describes a person that holds on to somebody. It's not a good thing. Example. She left her ex-boyfriend because he was too clingy. He was always holding on to her, wanting to be near her all the time. And she didn't like it. She thought it was annoying. So she broke up with him because he was too clingy. You hear the sound, mm, mm. Only the nasal sound here. No good. Not clingy, but clingy. Mm -y. Clingy. He was too clingy. Let's practice. Why did she break up with her ex-boyfriend? Was he too clingy? That's right. He was too clingy. Or this word, tangy. We have the same sound. It's the nasal sound only. Mm, tangy. Tangy. It's not tangy. It's tangy. Tangy is a flavor when something is strong, maybe acidic. That's a tangy flavor. The flavor is tangy. I like barbecue sauce because it's very tangy. It has vinegar and a lot of spices. Barbecue sauce is very tangy. What about you? Do you like tangy food? Very good. But then we see these two words that have the same spelling, N-G plus Y, but they're pronounced differently. Example, dingy and stingy. These two words have the regular N sound, N, plus the J, like juice. Together, stin -g. Together, stingy. Or din -g. Together, dingy. This wall is very dingy. It's dark and dirty. Someone needs to clean it. Let's practice. Is the wall very dingy? That's right. The wall is very dingy. Somebody needs to clean it. And the word stingy. Stingy is an adjective. It describes someone who wants to keep everything for themselves. Somebody who doesn't like to share. This boy has a lot of cookies, but he doesn't want to share his cookies with anybody else. He wants to keep them for himself. So he is stingy. He's very stingy. Let's practice. Is the boy very stingy? That's right. He's very stingy. And this word is lounge. Lounge. It makes the regular N, N, plus the J, lounge. It follows the same pattern as orange and change. N, J. It's a regular N, N, plus the soft J sound. Lounge. A lounge is a place to relax. Like at an airport, they have a special place where you can go and relax and have a drink. That's a lounge. He's having a drink in the lounge. Let's practice. Is he having a drink in the lounge? That's right. He's having a drink in the lounge. 
So let's review. NG has five different pronunciations. First, we see long with the sound N, which is a nasal sound. N, long. But then you have longer, where we have the hard G sound. Longer. With a nasal sound, N, plus the hard G, longer. And we have the J sound. The regular N, N, plus the J sound. Lounge. Nj. Lounge. And another one, when you see ing, you get two sounds there. You can say working with the ng sound, but you can also say working, working. So the ng can make the n sound. N, working. I'm working today. Or I'm working today. And we have ngs. Remember with ngs, it makes a soft g, g. Bangs, bangs, bangs. Things, things, fangs. Soft g. And don't say this either. One thing that she has done masterfully, unbelievably. Do not say masterfully. Do not pronounce it with four syllables. It's a three syllable word. Masterfully. I'll give you an example. Some of the best contemporary poetry, rap music, uses alliteration masterfully. What we see is a unique, personal, virtual reality that is masterfully constructed by our brain. 85% had a negative view of the national news media. Donald Trump has exploited this sentiment masterfully. Minus Beta shared this splendid object, so masterfully photographed. Keep watching the video for a complete explanation of why we pronounce words like this. Recently, I made a video about the pronunciation of F-U-L-L-Y, and I said the U is silent. The U is silent in these three words, masterfully, beautifully, and wonderfully. And it's true. The U is silent. And I had some viewers ask questions in the comments. So today we're going to explain why this is and how it works. Let's take a closer look. First, let's look at these three words. Hopefully, respectfully, and successfully. We see with these three words, the U is not silent. You hear the sound uh, uh, fully, fully. Again, hopefully, respectfully, and successfully. Why is it different? The first word, hopefully. The stress is on the first syllable, and there's only one syllable before F-U-L-L-Y. If there's only one syllable before F-U-L-L-Y, pronounce the U, hopefully. And now we look at respectfully and successfully. Here we have two syllables before F-U-L-L-Y. If you have two syllables, and the stress is on the second syllable, then pronounce the U. Respect. See, the stress is on the second syllable. Respectfully. So we pronounce the U. Success. Again, the stress is on the second syllable. So we pronounce the U. Successfully. Again, respectfully. You have four syllables. The stress is on the second syllable. Respectfully. And the fourth syllable. But what's important is you have two syllables before F U L L Y and you have a stress on the second syllable, not the first. So you pronounce the U respectfully and successfully. So what's the difference? Well, if I look at masterfully, beautifully, and wonderfully, we have two syllables before the F U L L Y, but the stress is on the first syllable. When you have two syllables before F-U-L-L-Y and the stress is on the first syllable, then the U is silent. That's when the U is silent. That's why we say masterfully. Masterfully. Not masterfully. Make it three syllables. Masterfully. Masterfully and beautifully and wonderfully. With these words, the stress is on the first syllable and you have two syllables before F-U-L-L-Y. That's when the U is silent. Beautifully synchronized, don't you agree? And conquer themselves so beautifully. Eve said you were wonderfully funny. The post office in the forest was a capital little institution and flourished wonderfully, for many things passed through it. Well, it's a shame you two didn't come with us to the movies last night. Oh. We saw a wonderfully funny American film. Yeah. Nice move. Beautifully done. You spoke beautifully. I've got to be me. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
She was so <laughs> wonderfully funny, so very generous. Let's practice with hopefully. Again, hopefully. Three syllables pronounced to you. Hopefully, it'll be sunny tomorrow. Let's practice. Will it be sunny tomorrow? That's right. Hopefully, it'll be sunny tomorrow. We hear the pronunciation with it will, contraction, it'll, it'll. The T changes to a fast D. It'll, it'll be sunny tomorrow. Hopefully, it'll be sunny tomorrow. Let's practice with respectfully, pronouncing the U. Uh, uh, fully, fully, uh, uh, fully. Respectfully, respectfully. Example, he got an offer, but he declined the offer. He respectfully declined the offer. He declined the offer with respect. So I can say he respectfully declined the offer. Let's practice. Did he respectfully decline the offer? That's right. He respectfully declined the offer. We hear the pronunciation declined the offer. The D in declined blends together with the TH, the offer. He declined the offer. The tongue goes up, makes a stop D, but it links together with the TH, so you don't really hear it. He respectfully declined the offer. Now let's practice with successfully. Example, he managed the company successfully for many years. Successfully. Successfully. The stress is on the second syllable, so we pronounce the U. Uh, uh, successfully. Let's practice. Did he manage the company successfully for many years? That's right. He managed the company successfully for many years. Again, the pronunciation managed in the past. Managed the company. You make a stop D and it links together with the. So you don't really hear the D. He managed the company. He managed the company successfully for many years. Link the words. Now let's look at some more words. Powerfully and mercifully. We see with these words we have two syllables before F-U-L-L-Y and the stress is on the first syllable. So we do not pronounce the U. Powerfully, not powerfully, not powerfully, not four syllables, the U is silent. So we say powerfully because the stress is on the first syllable and you have two syllables before F-U-L-L-Y. Powerfully. Example, she gave a speech and she expressed her opinions powerfully. That means in a powerful way. She expressed her opinions powerfully. Not powerfully, but powerfully. Flee, flee. Powerfully. Three syllables. She expressed her opinions powerfully. Let's practice. When she was giving the speech, did she express her opinions powerfully? That's right. When she was giving the speech, she expressed her opinions powerfully. By all the other names of God Almighty, we powerfully command ye. His grim aspect affects me powerfully, as is the barbaric white leg in which he stands. A head-on assault against a powerfully entrenched army. Let's practice with mercifully. Again, mercifully. You have two syllables before F-U-L-L-Y, and the stress is on the first syllable. So the U is silent. You don't hear it. Mercifully. Not mercifully. Mercifully. With mercy. With compassion. I pray to God that her death was mercifully swift. Well, it was so long ago. Mercifully for you, I've forgotten it. Example. The dog was sick, and the dog was going to die, and the dog was in pain. So the veterinarian mercifully put the dog to sleep with mercy because they didn't want the dog to be in pain. The veterinarian mercifully put the dog to sleep. Let's practice. Did the veterinarian mercifully put the dog to sleep? That's right. The veterinarian mercifully put the dog to sleep. Now let's practice with masterfully, beautifully, and wonderfully. Again, these words have two syllables before F-U-L-L-Y and the stress is on the first syllable. So the U is silent. 
Example, he played the guitar last night. He played the guitar masterfully. Masterfully. Three syllables. Don't pronounce the U. He played the guitar masterfully. And he sang. Sing in the present, sang in the past. Use the long A sound. Sang. Not sang, but sang. When you have A-N-G together, pronounce the A with a long A sound. Ang. He sang the song beautifully. So he played the guitar masterfully. He sang beautifully. And he performed wonderfully. Wonderfully. Three syllables. Don't pronounce the U. You have two syllables before F-U-L-L-Y and the stress is on the first syllable. So the U is silent. Wonderfully. He performed wonderfully. Let's practice. Did he play the guitar masterfully? That's right. He played the guitar masterfully. Did he sing beautifully? That's right. He sang beautifully. Did he perform wonderfully? That's right. He performed wonderfully. And this is the last word. This is a special word. Awfully. Or is it awfully? Well, you have one syllable before F-U-L-L-Y, so it should be awfully. You should pronounce the U according to the rule. But sometimes we don't. This word has two pronunciations. Sometimes you'll hear Americans say awfully and pronounce it with three syllables, pronouncing the U, following the rule, awfully. But it's not very common. It's more common to hear awfully, awfully, and not pronounce the U. Awfully. Two syllables, the U is silent. This is more common, especially with words like awfully sorry. I'm awfully sorry. And it just means very, very sorry. I'm awfully sorry. Or when you hear awfully with hard, it's awfully hard. And it means it's very, very difficult. Pronounce it with two syllables. Not awfully hard, but awfully. Awfully hard and awfully sorry. But I think your Gilbert is awfully bold to wink at a strange girl. I'm awfully sorry for your daughter. Seems like awfully hard work. I'm awfully glad you asked me that, Lloyd. Because I just happen to have two 20s and two 10s right here in my wallet. Roy, the wiki was trying awfully hard to protect this gold. But... They're awfully hard to get on. <laughs> of course, it's going to be awfully hard to fly it without... Oh, someone older I expect. Awfully sorry about that. Oh, and by the way, I'm awfully sorry about the New Yorker. Oh, I'm awfully sorry. Tom Baxter. I'm awfully sorry about this whole mess here. I'll tell you one thing, it's awfully hard to read. Awfully nice renovation. Oh. My. They, they worked you awfully hard last night, didn't they? Example, I'm awfully sorry to give you the bad news. Or I can say the doctor. The doctor was awfully sorry to give him the bad news. The doctor was very, very sorry. You can say the doctor was awfully sorry. Not awfully sorry, but awfully. He was awfully sorry. Let's practice. Was the doctor awfully sorry to give him the bad news? That's right. The doctor was awfully sorry to give him the bad news. Or when I say awfully hard, we hear two syllables. Awfully. It's awfully hard. Not it's awfully hard, but it's awfully hard. Example, it's awfully hard to study with all the noise. She's trying to study, but she hears a lot of noise, so it's very difficult. It's awfully hard. It's awfully hard to study with all the noise. Let's practice. Is it awfully hard to study with all the noise? That's right. It's awfully hard to study with all the noise. Let's review. So with words like hopefully, respectfully, and successfully, we pronounce a U. Why? Because with hopefully, you have one syllable before F-U-L-L-Y. Pronounce the U. If you have two syllables before F-U-L-L-Y and the stress is on the second syllable, pronounce the U. So again, hopefully, respectfully, and successfully. 
But with words like these, masterfully, beautifully, and wonderfully, you have two syllables before F-U-L-L-Y, but the stress is on the first syllable. In this case, the U is silent. Masterfully, beautifully, wonderfully. We also practice with these words, powerfully and mercifully. Again, you have two syllables before F-U-L-L-Y, and the stress is on the first syllable, so the U is silent. Powerfully, mercifully. And then we have this one strange word, awfully. Sometimes you'll hear awfully with three syllables, awfully, but it's more common to hear awfully with two syllables. Examples, I'm awfully sorry and it's awfully hard. This is also not correct. Or, the talented musician was playing the guitar masterfully. The word is not pronounced masterfully. Masterfully. Masterfully is not correct. It's not four syllables. We pronounce it with three syllables. Master flee. Flee. The last syllable is flee. Not fully, but flee. Master flee. Master flee. Put the stress on the first and third syllable. Master flee. Masterfully. If you do something very well, like a master, you do it masterfully. Example. He painted a painting. And he did it masterfully. I'm describing how he did the action. It describes the verb. He painted it masterfully. He did it well, like a master, like a pro. Let's practice. How did he do? How did he paint it? Did he paint it masterfully? That's right, he painted it masterfully. This is also not correct. He played the guitar beautifully. I cannot say beautifully. Beautifully. Four syllables is not correct. We pronounce it with three syllables. Beautifully. Beautifully. Put the stress on the first and third syllable. Beautifully. Flee. Flee is the final syllable. Flee. Beautifully. And of course, beautifully means to do something in a beautiful way. Again, the painter. He painted a painting. And he painted it beautifully. He did it in a beautiful way. Remember, three syllables. Beautifully. Beautifully. Let's practice. How did he paint the painting? Did he paint it beautifully? That's right, he painted it beautifully. He did a beautiful job. So we're seeing a pattern here with words like masterfully and beautifully. Let's look at one more. Wonderful. Wonderful is three syllables. But if I put L-Y after it, then it's wonderfully. See, it changes to three syllables. It's not wonderfully. We don't make it four when you put Lee after these words. So when you see F-U-L-L-Y, don't pronounce that U. Shorten the word and make it three syllables. Like masterfully, beautifully. Now we see wonderfully, wonderfully. Three syllables like the others. So wonderfully, when you do something in a wonderful way. Example, he did his performance. He sang and he danced. And he did his performance wonderfully. He performed wonderfully. Let's practice. Did he perform wonderfully? That's right. He performed wonderfully. Three syllables. Wonderfully. In a wonderful way. Very good. Thank you for watching. And if you liked this video, subscribe to our channel. And if you want to become a member, click the join button. And we'll see you next time.